So today we get to talk about hacking cars because that is the funnest thing ever. How many of you all are terrified at the notion of like your ex getting control of your vehicle while you're in it? Just me then, okay. Um, <laughs> the idea is to make sure that car safety systems are as resilient and safe as possible and there's not just uh, car hacking in terms of the vehicle itself but also in terms of monitoring vehicles, which is really interesting to me. So there's two things we're going to talk about in terms of cars. One is an attack on your car in terms of surveillance and monitoring where you are, and the other is an attack on the physical infrastructure of the car itself. Which is out of curiosity with a show of hands, which one's more interesting to you? The, the hacking the car itself or hacking the systems that watch your car? What's that? So the car itself, which one's more interesting? This one? Okay. And now the systems that monitor your car. Okay, so it's kind of evenly split. That's weird. All right. What, what are you afraid about when it comes to that kind of surveillance? It's invasive and it doesn't need mm -hmm. to be done on average everyday people. It's invasive and it doesn't need to be done on average everyday people. Why do you think it's invasive to monitor vehicles? Same reason it's invasive to stalk somebody. Same reason it's invasive to stalk somebody. Define invasive. It's not necessarily any of their business where mm -hmm. I decide to like to mm -hmm. drive my car at 2 o'clock in the morning, for example. Okay. What would you say if I told you that a gentleman of my acquaintance and one of the smartest people that I know discovered that easy pass tolls up and down the East Coast were being used to monitor all vehicles that had them and not in the clearly marked places, but in hundreds of other locations? block by block throughout New York City. You're being scanned by police cars, by uh, mobile and stationary systems that are watching out for vehicles. You're being scanned in almost every direction and your movements can be mapped out and tracked as a result of it. It's not as if, and, and we don't know what's happening necessarily, I, I keep trying to get him out to Seattle because I want to find out whether or not our, our to-go passes are being used anywhere but other than the 520, right? Yes? It feels like Minority Report. It feels like Minority Report. That is exactly what it feels like. It feels like you're, you're having your information stored up in advance to figure out whether or not you're likely to do something wrong. I think that that is a very clear ethical problem on a lot of levels and storing that information, not just, be, not, um, not just because of the, the primary goal, but because of all the externalities to that, right? There's a lot of negative externalities to storing people's information without them knowing about it that tracks their behavior. Most, in, most of all, just what are you doing with that information and who else has access to it, either legitimately or illegitimately? Right? How many of you have watched the talk that I'm talking about here? The one that discusses monitoring easy passes in cars up and down the East Coast, and especially in New York City. My friend took a, uh, a moo cow and stuck it on his dash. And every time his easy pass, he, he hacked an Arduino kit, I think. Um, you know, remember we talked about Arduinos and hardware hacking, right? And in the hardware week where it's just a little tiny kit that you can use it's a, um, to, to create physical responses in the outside world. Okay. Um, well, then please do look it up because I'm going to make you all go get Arduinos or play with them. And I don't know why this school doesn't have a good solid Arduino. Okay, that's, that's my stuff. That's not your stuff. All right. So the idea being that the little moo cow would just go off every time his car was hit by a beam reading his, his easy pass. Okay. Um, the video itself is, I, I saw some of his original stuff in like 2013, and just watching the video itself is terrifying. It is absolutely terrifying. You're being scanned up one side and down the other on every street in New York, basically. Um, every car that passes, some that are unmarked, it's really freaky and weird. And it's a great example of a surveillance state gone amok. Now, is anybody actually looking at that data? I don't know. It's entirely possible that all that information is, isn't being stored anywhere, that you're being read, but the information isn't going anywhere. I find it very unlikely. In, in different mm -hmm. states. There are different laws about it in different states. And yet, we are again in this, in this world of, the, of kind of the, the frontier of technology where sometimes people create a thing and it's extra legal, not because it was intentional, but because that just seems to be what happens with technology. Sometimes there's just things that happen that we don't expect. So those devices that were made to function to read for perhaps, I don't know, APBs out on criminals of some kind or another, may be storing that information inadvertently, and there could just be people that don't know that all those other systems exist. Who knows? Sometimes people duplicate systems, and it's a weird thing that happens. 
just every once in a while, uh, a rash of duplicate ideas, systems, and processes just break out on the world, like tablet computers or Bluetooth, right? Where every all of a sudden everything was being connected by radio waves, or design function changed. Or a really good example, the move from um, glossy to flat icons. Do you remember? This is it seems so strange and tiny, but do you remember that all at once every interface everywhere went to this flat interface instead of the glossy icons like on Apple? Yeah. Samsung, everything. And it was just overnight everyone did that. Not coordinated, just everyone chose to fa follow a fashion or a style, and that can happen with this too. Okay. When you envision looking at this kind of surveillance, what do you think you should do? I mean, what, what, what would be a solution that you would use to protect yourself from this kind of surveillance? Um, well, if I was if I was even one part of the surveillance, I'd do what I could to mm -hmm. limit who would be able to access that data. And then of course we okay. need uh, a watch. I'd be careful. Mm -hmm. know, I'd learn which um, what I can what I can and can't control yeah. so that I can you know, so that people can know about my information. Like for example, if you don't yes. want to know about your personal life, don't have a Facebook. Oh Lord. If you don't want anybody to know who you are, just don't be on the internet. Yeah, I've, I've gotten that before. Um, the, the idea that if you're the person in charge of all of this information that you would be very, very careful with it is a very important one. But again, a, a lot of the time when you see situations like this, there's no massive conspiracy. It's just a bunch of people doing what they think is right and it all adds up sometimes to a problem, right? There's not necessarily some screaming mastermind you know, atop a penthouse in Manhattan who is monitoring all of this information. Right? It can just simply be multiple different systems all collecting information for their own reasons and not necessarily always following best practices. Usually the simplest answer is the best one. How many of you have heard of Occam's razor? Okay, yeah. The simplest answer is usually the correct one. In this case, it's probably just a bunch of people collecting information for reasons they think is good and right, and yet it all adds up together into something really scary when you put it together. That's just distributed behavior, and it's, it's an interesting phenomenon, but it's not necessarily something gigantic to, to defend yourself against, and there's no one in charge of a lot of it. So what about the fact that with systems like this, with surveillance like this, you can actually track people and figure out behaviors that are problematic, like who's likely to kill someone? What if, what if this does lead to minority report? What if it leads to a safer society? where people are constantly aware that they're being watched and as a result don't engage in bad behaviors. Is that wrong? Yeah. Okay, I got a no, a yes, and an it's arguable. Um, let's start with it's arguable. <laughs> Why is it arguable? It's arguable because it depends on if they go overboard to the point where mm -hmm. nobody has... Uh, well, st know. stop for one second because you just hit it right there. What if they go overboard? Define overboard. Bringing someone to a degree mm -hmm. where they can't well, we all, yes, that's true, but we all accept, even right now, to some extent, some limitations on our personal freedom in order to congregate with one another. We've all established in, in, in this room a social norm, which is that it's not okay to bring coffee in and set it on the desk because you could spill it on the terminals. And that's both a rule and a social norm here, right? And yet that is a limiting factor on our behavior that you may want your coffee in front of you, yet you've accepted this limitation. Are you okay with accepting that limitation? If I have a place where I can, if I can, or I can uh, do whatever I want mm -hmm. without, uh, even if it doesn't hurt anybody, if I can do whatever I want, then uh, at least I still have that freedom. That is very true. There's always going to be social limitations because. Yes, there are always going to be social limitations, but then we start to verge into the question of where social merges into technological, and it's merging ever closer and along more and more fronts. That, that front of where society touches technology is widening, it's increasing every day, or more accurately, it's lengthening because it's touching at more and more and more points. Okay? So before we move on to hacking interior systems of cars, which is really fascinating to me. Um, I, I personally am more interested in the surveillance state issues and stuff like that. Um, but I am also interested in the technology that lets us take over cars because it's exactly the same technology that lets us drive them in the first place, right? Yes? I would have low jacks of cars. Could you, you got low jacks? Well, okay. I mean, low jack was really good when it first came out. Well, sure. A low jack is still a great idea if your car gets taken off without you. But at the same time, is the is the behavior of your vehicle being monitored over time? Yes, and that's that's kind of an interesting question. I don't actually know whether or not LoJack maintains a sketch map of your positioning in order to figure out where something dropped off the map if 
the Lojack is taken out of the car. Which that'd be an interesting question. Why don't you all take a look and find out whether or not Lojack retains that information over time, and what their system is? Because you know, do you report and then they ping the Lojack, or are they tracking over time? I think it's probably likely that, given privacy concerns, they probably ping when a report is made. But I don't know. It'd be interesting to figure out. Because yeah, that's actually right halfway. That's a good question because it's halfway in between tracking cars and actually hacking the car itself. Okay. So if you get in a car. Why, how do you determine the behaviors that you're going to engage in in the car? You mean as a driver? As a driver. I don't necessarily mean that. I mean the behaviors that you would engage in to determine the rules of, of the activity. How do you know how to drive a car? Because there's a test. <laughs> that test is a dumb test. <laughs> okay, who knows how to drive and wants to tell me how they learned? Okay, how'd you learn? Depth perception okay. and common sense. Depth perception and common sense, yes. Just by doing it. There we go. Okay, so now we're getting to some really interesting questions. Depth, common sense, and just by doing it. So the analogs in the computer world are just by doing it is just a learning algorithm of some kind, right? A neural network or some way for the vehicle to learn correct behavior or to statistically predict that correct behavior rapidly enough that it can make a decision faster than a human can. Death perception and common sense. Death perception, that's an easy problem. How far away is that? There's a laser. Boom, and we're good. So uh, could you let her in real quick? Oh, the door's open. Door's open. Come on. There we go. <laughs> so the idea being that, that we use death perception to figure out how far away something is. That is a mechanically easy problem. And I'm not interested in mechanically easy problems. I'm interested in problems that are interesting, like common sense, like teaching a computer common sense. How do you teach a computer the common sense that's required to not sit at a four-way stop when the rule is that you come to a complete stop. Let's envision ourselves in California right now because we call it the California stop for a reason. And cars continually roll through the stop and the car gets stuck in place, the, the auto driving car is getting stuck in place because it's following the rules and waiting for everyone else to come to a complete stop before it goes. And it'll get stuck there for hours. Right exceptions to the Right exceptions to the rules. What is the definition of an exception to that rule that would be okay and still within the law? There isn't one meaning that you have to teach the computer to selectively, probabilistically, be illegal. How cool is that? You have to teach a computer to break the law to make it drive properly and function on the roads. This is the kind of thing that can get tuned over time as more cars take over with autopilot. There's going to be the ability to, I would say, create wandering and, um, and interconnected networks that teach cars how to talk to each other as well as the road. Right? If you have four uh, self-driving cars that all arrive at, a, at a, uh, uh, a stop at the same time, how do you decide which one goes first? Whichever one takes the initiative to go first. Whichever one takes the initiative to go first. Mm. But which one goes first in terms of that initiative? How do you make a car take the initiative? A computer. I depend on the factors such as which car was always driving at the same Okay. The they all arrive at the exact same time, at the exact same place, at the exact same speed four-way stop. Which car gets to go first? The bigger one. I, the bigger one. Yeah. I'm going to go with who cares? Because the four of them together can decide probabilistically one through four. And over time, you'll average out to the exact same amount of time spent at a stop sign. Does that make sense? Exactly. It's just rock, paper, scissors, right? And over time, you're going to get to the correct answer. They just sit there and go, OK, we all arrived at the same time. Everybody pick a number between 1 and 4, which is basically what those computers are going to do. And over time, they'll average out to having the same amount of time at a stop. Even if you're the last one, you're still going to have the same probability at every four-way stop in the future of getting selected to move higher in the chain, right? Does this make sense? This is how computers decide things. They're like, what the heck? And yet, there's an interesting question there of fairness that we have to build into cars too, right? Because what's fair? The fairest thing is that the first person there gets to go first. And, and our, it is just our human perception that that's the way to go. What if there is a distinct value to those cars? Like say one of them is an ambulance and one has um, a, a, a nursery field trip in it and one is a guy nobody really likes and one is a soccer mom. The 
ambulance. What you can teach, yeah, you could teach the ambulance to get to go first. You could teach the the school kids to go next after that. You could flip a coin if you wanted to between two people of roughly equal social value: a businessman, a soccer mom, you know, a high-powered attorney, and she's out for the day and. You know, she's got high value, but she doesn't look like it. How do you teach a car how to make those picks? Are you absolutely, I mean, is, is like the tryptophan like almost like a deja vu situation at this point where you're like, you've already eaten the turkey in your head and that's why the sleeping is happening? Because I do that. I like project out to the meal and I'm, I'm actually thinking about these stuffing waffle things that I saw on Lifehacker where you take waffle or stuffing the next day and you put it in the waffle maker and then you make waffles with stuffing and then instead of syrup, you use gravy which is possibly the most brilliant thing I've ever seen. How would the car know about the social standing of these people? Yes. How would the car know about the social standing of these people? It could scan the license plate. Scan the license plate? And figure mm -hmm. out that person's ranking in society. Ranking in society. How would we do that with a number? Net income? Tax returns? That depends on what uh, school you're valuing at the moment. That is exactly correct. Credit score. Credit score. That one's terrifying. <laughs> Holla student loans. Driver. What's that? Driver's record. Driver's record. I like that one. Whoever's a better driver. But then they're all auto cars. So they should theoretically all have, on average, the same driving record, unless they have poorer software. There's an interesting thing. How about corporations get to decide which one goes first? In corporate agreements. And you purchase a service that defaults or rounds up to you being the one that gets to go first for $39.95 a month, software as a service in your car. Oh, Lord, I know the 520. That's going to be ridiculous. I'm so glad I'm not in Redmond anymore. All right. That's why this, this kind of stuff is happening. And do you see why I've spent so much time trying to get you to think about the issues in technology as we go forward? Because there's so much interesting problem space here. There's so much interesting things you can sit there and think about uh, and in terms of the philosophy of the creation of this technology. The reason why we, we sometimes have these problems creating solutions to problems is that a lot of people think the same way. So if you think you've got a great and creative idea and a great solution for how to think differently about something, it probably means you've got an interesting problem to work on and people will be interested in that. So those two different kinds of car hacking are the things that I wanted to talk about. Surveilling the cars and actually hacking the cars themselves. Um, are there any questions about what it means to go after cars? We personalize cars a lot. I mean, we've got cars in popular culture, you know, for everybody here who watches Supernatural. Don't tell me the baby doesn't have personality. So it's a 69 Impala, 68 Impala, 67 Impala, 68 Impala. So these are, we personalize these things and it matters to us. So what questions do you have about why car hacking is a special topic? Um, when, did the, when does the car uh, turn out like Kit from? When does the car turn out like Kit? Oh, like um, Knight Rider? Yes. I don't know, but that is a really great question. I don't know. Kit from Knight Rider. I don't really want David Hasselhoff talking to me in the morning. <laughs> I mean, there are voices that I would hear in the morning, and I would be fine with it, but I... Wait, is it... Was it Hasselhoff who voiced Kit? No. no some other guy, and he was the one in the show. Yeah, I still don't want David Hasselhoff talking to me in the morning. So, But there's great voices out there. I heard a GPS with Darth Vader on it that is absolutely brilliant. Roundabout. Oh, yes. Adding those systems in, the surveillance, the bits and pieces that can be that can be taken apart. In the, the Tesla hack that was just recently done, the, uh, the folks there decided to hack the infotainment system. So you can display different messages, start and stop the car. And this is demonstrated with access to the vehicle. It's really scary. All right? It's really interesting, but at the same time, you're putting your safety in the hands of people that treat you probabilistically. So be aware about it. And if you want to, go into the field and start creating great solutions in this problem space. I especially love that idea of being able to upgrade your driving experience with credits that let you do things like default to going first in traffic or like who gets to merge first. You know somebody's going to find a way to monetize that. This, is that, this, is it, am I the only one who's geeking out over this? Okay, no good. You're, you're, you're loving this. All right, good. <laughs> Any last questions? Okay.